We're going to go ahead and move into our question and answer session. So our first question that we've got is, with the potential for so much damage from a large earthquake, how do you communicate the earthquake science in a way that doesn't result in inaction because the problem seems unmanageable? Well, that's a great, a great question. One of, one of the things that, that Tom mentioned that's really important to know is that um, the ground motions from these large, deep, and far offshore subduction zone earthquakes are not as immediately catastrophic as most people would tend to think. And people who've ridden through, say, the Loma Prieta or Silomar earthquakes tend to equate ground motions with something like that and then extrapolate that to a magnitude 9, uh, which isn't the right isn't the right analogy. The, the ground motions are actually relatively modest and the, the main thing about it is that the duration is very long and that our built our built environment is very weak. And those are the those are the things to keep in mind that it's 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 very possible to mitigate as Tom was um, as Tom was pointing out and that it's not uh, not an unmanageable unmanageable hazard at all. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that uh, with Chris's comments and and again, um, you know we have tools to to assess the hazard ahead of time and with those tools uh, we can superimpose the built environment, uh, our infrastructure, our, our houses, our, our schools, and so on and so we can uh, from that superposition of the of the hazard and the built environment we can we can understand the risk. And we can prioritize um, our mitigation efforts uh, by addressing the highest, the highest risk uh, scenarios. Yeah, and this, Jeff, that, 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 and that was the philosophy behind the Oregon Resilience Plan. We can't do everything at once. We want to prioritize what, what's most important to get first, where do you need to get started for a longer term process. And even on an individual level, I mean, there are multiple programs in this area and others that try to break down just the preparedness aspect into manageable steps. Uh, but it's always a challenge to communicate this is a serious hazard you need to pay attention to without uh, unintentionally giving the message. And it's so bad that you're kind of screwed regardless of what you do. I, I guess mm -hmm. I'd just like to follow up, if we could, uh, just to say that uh, you know, the, le the lessons from the, I think we should point people towards looking at what happened in the, in the recent large subduction zone earthquakes elsewhere. And uh, there were definitely um, damage and, and fatalities, but as I, as I tried to emphasize, those are mainly associated with the tsunami. Uh, and fortunately, along Cascadia, the coastal population is not huge. Um, it's not the bulk of the population. So um, we should be able to design mitigation strategies for those people and as well as for the bulk of the people that will experience the earthquake along the I-5 corridor that are quite, really quite far from, from where the earthquake happened. Thanks for the answers to that. Um, I know you mentioned a lot of the issues. Can you talk a little bit more about what's being done to mitigate those? Are you talking about for the coast in particular? In the coast in particular, yes. I, I can. I know. In you know, for, for Oregon, we we're trying to do a couple different things. You know, we're we're trying not to be prescriptive to to the set to the set in the sense of saying, okay, you can't built here, so figure something else out. For a lot of communities, if it's not in the relatively flat area that is the inundation zone, uh, they get into the coast range pretty quickly or other unsuitable areas to develop. So it is it is a series of very difficult choices, and probably one of the best examples of that is the hospital in Gold Beach that's essentially being rebuilt in the same area that it, that it was before. It'll be a better building, but it's still going to be in a dangerous zone. Um, giving uh, communities uh, a chance, since they have to set aside urban growth reserves, uh, making it easier for them to do so in less dangerous areas, and also streamlining the process so that after a disaster, rather than trying to say, well, here's where we have to rebuild, giving them more options so that they can rebuild the extent that they plan to uh, more intelligently rather than simply using the same area. Those are some of the initiatives that we, we 
started working on last year, as well as um, having some of the state agencies that are involved in this, uh, having them funded to assist the communities in the in the land use planning that they're actually required to do under state law. Well, I would just add to that that it's um, that the as as Jeff and Tom pointed out, I think we all pointed out that the this knowledge is relatively new, and uh, individual communities are still struggling with exactly how to address it, and there isn't a there is no one consensus to this. It's a it's it's a difficult problem. You know, we we uh, people who live and work and and own businesses on the coast, we have they and we all don't don't want the coast to be closed for business and and people want to live at the coast and that's going to continue. But how to how to do that in in a realistic way and in a, in a sensible way that'll prevent loss of life in, life in the future um, is is a struggle. And so the Gold Beach Hospital. That Jeff mentioned is is uh, one one example of that, and so um, it's a, it's a learning process. I would say that uh, mistakes will be made, and uh, and uh, some good positive steps will be made, and hopefully those will evolve into uh, uh, into good directions in the not too distant future. And as as Tom pointed out, uh, we have lots of examples of people around the world that have done this successfully. The Japanese example, and even the Chilean example. Uh, and we can we can learn from that. We don't have to start from from square one to look for examples of how to have a successful and thriving society in a in a place with a hazard as high as this. I'd echo what Chris just said, and I I bring in another example of a of a community that's struggling with resiliency, and that's San, the city of San Francisco, and they conducted a policy study to look at. Um, they basically asked the question, what infrastructure and critical facilities are needed to make sure, and when, they are, when are they needed, in order to make sure that the city, the city will remain uh, viable following the next big earthquake on the San Andreas Fault or the Hayward Fault. And so they identified things like how, how soon do the hospitals need to be open and operational? How soon do police stations, fire departments? And transportation systems, hosp you know, hospitals, and went down the list. And they identified where the city was in terms of existing infrastructure and where it needed to be. And I think that's a good model for communities that are looking at. I think that's a good question for communities to a ask themselves: Is following the Ca Ca Cascadia subduction zone earthquake? How soon do we want to be viable as a community, or how do we make sure that we always remain viable, and that we're not um, we're not shuttered by this uh, earthquake and the tsunami? And you know, it's, the solutions will be different in different places depending on the geography and the needs of the community. But I think that's a useful approach to take. Tom, I, just just to follow up, I, I agree with Tom with what he just said about San Francisco, and and one very simple, concrete step people might consider taking when when, when community entities are trying to you know struggling with what to do is uh, to take field trips to places where there have been successes, Chile and, and Japan in particular, and and rather than reinvent the wheel, just learn directly from from what's known to work. Great, thanks. We have one question here about how have the implications such as casualties, hotels and inundation zones, et cetera, been taken into account if the earthquake were to happen in the summer months when you have a lot of tourists in towns? Because it's so difficult to model casualties, period, uh, you know, actual numbers are difficult. The bigger challenge is, you know, how do you get people out of, say, the tsunami inundation zone when you have a lot more people there to begin with? Uh, Nate Wood from the USGS and others have done some really good modeling in terms of here's how long it's going to take people to get to the safety. Here's how long they'll have. Factor in then the fact that if they have to go over, say, a bridge, even if it's a footbridge to get to safety, will that bridge still be standing? And that drives some less conventional options like tsunami resilient and earthquake resilient structures that are actually within the inundation zone and telling people to go 
toward the water if, if, instead of away if that's the only way out. Those are some of the options that are being reviewed. Some communities have actually uh, moved forward on that. But we know that in the summer months there will be more people on the coast. Uh, there may be fewer people uh, in the valleys as a result. But it doesn't, it doesn't change the essential hazards or the needs. It just adds a few thousand people to the totals. Great. And overall, here's another question coming in from the audience. How worried should we be about the big one in the Northwest? For this, Jeff, from my perspective, I don't think you should be worried. I mean, I don't worry about it. I, I never found that to be really constructive. I, I think all of us want people to pay attention and take it seriously, but rather than fretting, uh, do something about it. Realize that if you can prepare yourself for a major earthquake, you can prepare yourself for just about all the other stuff that can come down the road. Again, our last two presidentially declared disasters in the metro area were snowstorms. Um, we have power outages. We have wind storms. For a lot of people, they uh, are not sufficiently resilient to withstand 48 hours without power. Uh, they don't have much in the way of a reserve for medications or consumable medical supplies like home oxygen. I mean, again, we see this in every single event. So trying to channel that concern into productive action rather than fretting. If you want probabilities, Chris gave you a pretty good set of numbers. Tom gave you some numbers. More, it's We know it's going to happen. We can't say it's going to happen tomorrow but we've seen all sorts of other things happen, storms, power outages, et cetera, so they will continue to happen. Yeah, this is, this is Chris. I'd, I'd agree completely with Jeff, is channel that worry energy into, into some action. And, you know, we're in the, in the awkward position of, of having built our society on top of a grenade, essentially, and, not, and, and, not, and we didn't know it. And so, uh, and, now, and now we do, so we can translate that uh, at, at first is fear and worry into into some s simple actions, uh, taking care of uh, um, yourself and your family, you know, looking at how your house is built, uh, looking at supplies you may have, thinking about maybe a gas shutoff valve to keep your, because uh, often houses burn down in earthquakes rather than have structural damage. And then beyond that, think about the buildings people, think about th the buildings you work in. And if it, uh, if it looks like a the building you work in is a collapse hazard, then maybe maybe mobilize your uh, your uh, fellow employees and managers and whatever to to try to make the company move towards uh, a retrofit. And this is sort of a bottom up approach, and we live in more or less a bottom up uh, society, and that's the way things happen. To channel channel the energy into into to positive steps and ed people can educate themselves and, and learn these things. They're not, um, not difficult to find information and look at, look at examples of other places and what, what they've done. So this is a long, uh, this is going to, to make the Pacific Northwest resilient and make it perform as well as Japan does in an earthquake, this is going to take some time. They have, a, they have a thousand year head start on us after all. And so uh, it's going to be a long sustained effort but worry doesn't help that much. I don't worry about earthquakes. I live here, and uh, but I, I do take some simple actions to mitigate that risk. And, and any anywhere we live, there's going to be something you have to consider: hurricanes, uh, floods, tornadoes, whatever, what have you. And people take relatively simple steps to to channel that worry into action. This is Tom. I agree with both Chris and Jeff and. Uh sentiments and um, I think in many cases once once we're aware of hazards and we can think through the consequences of the hazards to our businesses and and our our daily lives and in many cases business businesses recognize that uh, you know if they're not prepared for this event um, they're they're going to lose business or go out of business you know if the if the port facilities are closed um, you know the ports uh, shipping continues. They just they use the port that's available, and so the the port business will go elsewhere. And so being prepared is is um, you know it's a good business decision. It's will help you uh, maintain your business and the viability of it following the event. So there's lots of uh, lots of reasons to prepare for earthquakes uh, that 
other than just surviving them. Uh, I think some people have a sense that earthquakes are great killers, and that's not really the case in the U.S. Uh, relatively fair, few people are even injured in earthquakes, but it's the economic loss that can be quite damaging. And uh, so whatever we can do to help um, minimize uh, not only uh, our loss of life and, and numbers of injuries, but our property damage and our ability to conduct business will, will speed our recovery as well. Thanks. And we have one other question here. What will the impact of coast seismic landslides in a major Cascadia earthquake be? Uh, I can start, and I imagine Tom will have comments as well. Uh, landslides are really common in the Pacific Northwest. We get them every winter. Uh, and so uh, a lot more will likely be triggered by any, any version of the Cascadia earthquakes. And since we have a, a, a coast range with uh, mountain passes where uh, most of our access to the coast is on roads through these passes, it's, there's a pretty strong chance that most of the roads to the coast will be closed for some period of time during, during a Cascadia earthquake. And so as, as Jeff mentioned in the Oregon Resilience Plan, the, you know, those, the chances of that and the, and the time to recover uh, were, were outlined in that report. And in, in some cases, it's quite a long time. Uh, we also have uh, a number of bridges that are likely to go down at the same time. So, uh, you know, what we what we tend what we tell people in Oregon is that there the coast may well be cut off uh, for quite some time in terms of road transport and access to those areas will be mostly by air and by sea for some some period of time. Um, and the landslides will occur inland as well in Seattle and and Portland and uh, the. Most of, most of the past ones have been mapped out, but these are uh, future landslides from a, from, a, from a future earthquake may not, may not happen in places that are obvious or well known uh, either. At, at some time in the past, even very large landslides may have um, blocked the Columbia River, for example. There's a location called the Bridge of the Gods that was a, a landslide that backed the Columbia River up for uh, 20 or 30 miles. So something something very dramatic like that is a, is a remote but uh, a possible outcome as well. This is Tom. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fair to say that landslides, uh, there will be lots of landslides uh, caused by this uh, big subduction zone earthquake. How fast uh, it will take to um, move the landslide debris out of, out of the way and, and restore our, our roads to service, uh, you know, I'm not so aware of, but generally my experience in California is that uh, the landslides we get are cleared pretty quickly following an earthquake in a few days, but we may not be dealing with the numbers of landslides that we might get in a subduction, Cascadia subduction zone earthquake in the close ranges. Great. Thank you so much. Well, that's all the time we have for questions for today's webinar. Thank you very much, Chris, Jeff, and Tom, for presenting today and also for staying on a little longer to answer all the questions. And this concludes our webinar for today.